Viewer discretion is advised. The factory is the place where goods were made. Extraordinary goods that bend the laws of physics. Goods that were produced under tears, sweat, and blood. A place where a group of men started an organization that would go on and keep these objects in check. A history of violence and human folly. But it will never be written up. It was a choice made early on in the creation of the foundation. A researcher searched within the foundation seeking for the origins and found himself in front of an O5. You have dug deep enough past the angel with the flaming sword, and now you've found yourself intrigued by the factory, the O5 said to him. So here it is, plain and simple, straight from the horse's mouth. This is the story of an O5 council member, a story about the factory. The factory is SCP-001. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you a SCP Foundation tale, one of the many proposals of SCP-001, The Factory. The factory was built in 1835, known as Anderson Factory. It was named after an industrialist named James Anderson. It was the largest factory yet designed and built in America, a good mile at its widest, three stories tall throughout, with a special seven-story tower by the front gate that Anderson lived in. It was designed to be the ultimate factory, capable of taking care of everything, including the housing of workers. People could be born, work, live, and die without ever leaving the confines of the factory. It was almost like a small city, where people lived and breathed and worked. And worked they did, on everything from cattle raising and slaughtering, to textiles, to everything else under the sun. What people didn't know was that James Anderson worshipped the Satan. What was known was that he was very particular in the building of his factory and in the placement of the machinery within it. Survivors claimed the floor was engraved with arcane symbols that were only visible when blood flowed across them. But then again, rumors are bound to surface in a place where people lived and mingled. Anderson made his money on the blood and sweat and sometimes body parts of the lower class. He thought of them as less than human. Nobody knew about his predilections at the time, and so people flocked to the factory in search of work in times when job opportunities were scarce. Plus, a place to both work and live at the same time? Well, of course people wanted in. Never mind the harsh hours, working conditions, and the sadistic security force. They were forced to work 16 hours a day, only ever stopping on Sundays. Instead of having individual rooms, the workers share rooms with eight other people, sleeping in shifts of three. If any of the workers was injured in the course of duty, which most people were, they were expected to just keep working. Anyone too injured to work was dragged off by security, and never to be seen again. For 40 years, the factory cranked out all types of things. Meat, clothes, and weapons. Never mind that the beef might be mixed with human. That's the theory of where the injured workers went to. And the dye for the clothes, especially the red ones, human blood. The situation didn't change until somebody got out. The worker who got out managed to meet with the president. And in 1875, he enlisted the aid of a high-ranking military captain. He was given an assignment to investigate the factory and put a stop to it. He gathered his men and went in loaded for bear. The captain had seen the most abominable acts behind the theater of war, but nothing compared to the horrors he saw in the factory. People chained to the line, living ones next to the dead, and damn hard to tell which was which. Children working inside tight machine spaces. Sometimes another child would be ordered to get in there. To do what, you ask? To scour the flesh from their bones by the greet wheels and cogs, of course. The men went in the factory without much issue until Anderson's creations showed up. He had been taking the injured workers and experimented on them. Men with multiple arms sewn together, some of them combined with animals. Horrible monstrosities out of the worst nightmare. After waves after waves of not quite living creatures, many good men were lost that night. 150 men went in and only 93 survived. When they finally found Anderson in his office, unfazed by their presence, the men hung him from the tower window with his own entrails. As he died, he laughed. It doesn't matter. You think this will be over when I'm dead? You can kill me all you like. But the factory, my factory, 
will go on and on and on and on. The men spent a week cleaning the factory, freeing the workers, putting down things they found in the lightless rooms within the basements. They tried to make sense of the things they found, sorted and stocked them in a house nearby. That marked the first encounter with anomalous objects, toy guns that shot real bullets, a yo-yo that would flay the skin of anyone it touched, hammers that only worked on human flesh, a breed of skeletal horse that ran faster than anything the men had ever seen, cloaks that seemed woven from the night itself which allowed men to gain access to another dimension, tools both wondrous and horrible. Some thought these objects must be miracles sent from God, holy relics to be worshipped, some, on the other hand, thought these are abominations and should be destroyed. Some wanted to keep making and selling these to the highest bidder, while some thought to just take it to the president and let him decide. The captain himself, however, thought to use the factory as a place to contain these things and find a way to make them work for his fellow men. It didn't take long for infighting to break out. With only 12 people remaining, the captain decided to go through with his plan. It was the beginning of the O5 Council, the beginning of the Foundation. They were able to acquire backings from powerful people through leverages, and then some investments here, a simple invention there. Soon enough, they began to recruit more people, agents, researchers, operatives. Eventually, they built a city around the factory, which they took to calling Site Alpha. 1911 was when it all went wrong. They realized there was an alien race living among them. It was the only time the Foundation wiped out an entire race of beings, and the captain was responsible for it. The fairies overran the factory, slaughtered the people. They shrugged off their weapons like they were nothing. The captain watched his comrades die and ran deep into the dark guts of the factory. He was being chased all the way down. He could hear them behind him, feel their breath upon his neck. He was just barely one step ahead. He came to a door he had never seen before. He opened the door and dived through it, and everything was different inside. He felt safe, like nothing could harm him. The room was dark red. There was a steady thrumming of a gigantic heartbeat. In front of him, the remains of James Anderson. It began speaking with him. The factory, the tools, no matter what you did to them, you fed it. You helped it grow. But you see, these fairies, they'll destroy them, and you as well. It laughed at the captain mockingly. It was the first time since the liberation of the factory that he had felt such hopelessness. But I can help you. I can make all this like they never happened. All you need to do is just offer you and your fellow men. He knew it was a bad idea, but at that moment, he saw his friends and family killed by the fairies in flashes of visions. The captain agreed, and Anderson smiled. Once again, the captain found himself alive upon the ramparts, watching the fairies coming down from the hills. He looked around him. The foundation was alive once more. In their hands were weapons, weapons so strong they used them to slaughter the fairies with them. Everywhere the fairies lived, they went, and slaughtered them. His fellow O5 questioned his decision, thinking that they should save some in case that they might ever need them. The captain overruled them. He couldn't afford to take the chance. Soon, they moved away from the factory and shut it down, burying it under tons of rubble. The captain thought he had gotten away from paying the price of accepting Anderson's help until one day he found one of the old toy guns that shot real bullets on his desk. The factory knew where he was. All you need to do is just offer you and your fellow men. Anderson's words kept replaying in his head. He knew he had to pay the price. The factory needed bodies. They needed someone who didn't matter, someone disposable. Hence, the D-Class was established. People were sent in there and never to be heard from again. Sometimes the factory just took anyone on its own, and the people never knew it was coming. It just reached out and took them. They moved their things away and started calling them Special Containment Protocol, which meant that they focused on containing them. They thought they had them tamed, but the captain had realized that they will never tame these things. 
containing was the only humanly possible way for them to live alongside them. Remember to check out my new animation channel, The Rubber Talks, where I share my life story, thoughts, and opinions. Just click on the link in the description to enter the rubber's world. Before we end this video, we are proud to present these incredibly sweet pieces of fan art. A big thank you to all of you. You can now send us your fan art, and we will be more than happy to show off your best art piece in our next video. Check out our description below on how to submit. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Which SCP do you want to see in the next video and why it is interesting? Let us know in the comment below. We will draw your story and share it with the world. Don't forget to click like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. Please share it to your friends if you like this video. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.